I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. My guest today is Melanie Newport, a historian at the University of Connecticut and author of the forthcoming book, This Is My Jail, Local Politics and the Rise of Mass Incarceration. Thank you for joining me today, Melanie. Thanks. Uh, Melanie, what inspired you to write this this book that you've been working on uh, that will be due out uh, towards the end of this year? I would say it was a, really a sense of confusion. A lot of people don't know the difference between jails and prisons, so I wanted to get to the bottom of why do we have jails? Uh, why do we expand jails? Who goes to jail? Um, and it turned out that there is a really um, exciting but also troubling uh, history that I was able to, to find in Chicago. Um, so that I ended up looking to that case study just because there were so many fascinating people that contributed to the development of that jail. We recently hosted Michael Walker, a sociologist um, who did an ethno ethnography of jails and um, it was the first of its kind, but the important part of the program for me and our viewers, I think, was delineating between jails and prisons. And I just ask you to do that again for our viewers because they've been mutually associated um, without any delineation or differentiation. Tell our viewers what the difference is. Right. So I'm actually going to start with the definition of prisons because yeah. I think that helps with what people already know. Um, right. So prisons are for people who have been sentenced for felony crimes. They're usually, uh, they're only run by states. Uh, so uh, what makes jails different is that many of the people in jail um, are awaiting trial. They haven't been sentenced for crimes. Um, and if they are sentenced for crimes, they're sh serving very short sentences. Um, but I think one of the most important things that I hope that my book brings into relief is that jails are also urban political institutions, right? So these are places that are usually run by sheriffs or uh, city officials. Um, these are hyper local places um, in our cities and our counties that we have to care about. One of the things that Michael pointed out in our interview was that um, in jail, um, you often are living, you know, awaiting a trial or some sort of judicial proceeding. You haven't been convicted yet. And, and often the lights stay on all the time. Like there, there is no time for sleep uh, or at least the traditional idea of sleep where you turn the lights off. And I found that really something I hadn't heard before um, and something that folks should understand about just the context of having it living, awaiting a judicial proceeding, uh, not being found, you know, guilty, uh, but yet, um, you know, basically being in a situation um, that is going to most likely produce a bad mental or physical health outcome. Yeah, I mean, so I think one of the things that's really crucial is that, you know, that warehousing element, right, where people are just kind of stuck in jail with nothing to do but wait, right, is one of the kind of continual functions of jails. Um, jails have changed over time dramatically throughout mm -hmm. history, you know, um, in the progressive era in Chicago, they had people making bricks. Um, throughout the history, people have been involved in road crews, right, doing kind of unpaid labor. Um, the notion that jail is a place of kind of pretrial punishment has really only developed in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, the idea that there should be a punitive element before trial. Um, but that doesn't mean that the jails of the past were nice places. You know, it wasn't until uh, the 70s that families consistently got uh, the right to bring children to visit their parents in jail. Um, the kind of health care provision is deeply uh, uneven throughout history. Um, mentally ill people being shackled to beds has been a very normal thing throughout the history of jails. Um, but I think the deprivation is something that incarcerated people from, you know, my sources in the 19th century to the present. They talk about a lot, right? You're cut off from work, you're cut off from family. Um, 
all of the, the things you rely on for stimulation and support. In your mind, in looking at the, the link between local politics and jails um, in, in Chicago, kind of where did that, that linkage start and where is that linkage today? Right. I mean, so one of the ways that scholars have long talked about jails as being kind of pre-modern institutions, right, that these are kind of reflection of an urge to just kind of remove people from society temporarily. Um, but, but I think when you put in the political story, um, you see that the, the modern jail really emerges as part of the Jim Crow project of urban racial regulation and particularly the consolidation of white political authority through patronage. And so when I talk about that, you know, this is the notion that um, people should be able to benefit either through um, people in power should be able to benefit from the jail, you know, in terms of providing jobs to people in their political party, um, controlling resources, or just experiencing the pleasure of, of having power over other people. And so one of the ways that I think about jails today is that this is not a, a question of whether it's the new Jim Crow or the old Jim Crow. This is just kind of persistent Jim Crow uh, that we see as a foundational aspect of American politics. In doing the research over this span of decades, Separate from that point, I think it's a really good point about the old versus new Jim Crow, and it's just a continuity of Jim Crow. When did the realization of mass incarceration happen in, in sort of both your world as a historian, but also in public policy? Because that expression and term, I mean, in the 90s with, you know, the, the um, you know, and, and really subsequently for, th for three decades, um, there was a tough on crime movement that seemed just imperceptibly kind of uh, disconnected from or not even aware of the looming mass incarceration. So I'm wondering in your mind in doing the research you did when awareness of that began that, you know, in, in, is it related at all to racialized policies and the old versus the new Jim Crow, because while there may be a continuity in one Jim Crow, I don't know that there's a continuity when it comes to mass incarceration because it, 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 it didn't happen overnight. It was, you know, it was a process. Right. And that, I, this is why I highlight the, the kind of continuity style side of the story right and as a historian my job is change over time right and so this is how i have to really get into what does this change look like at different moments but for me it, you know what shocked me about looking at the statistics on incarceration in cook county which has in historically the most uh, surprising and shocking kind of racial history african americans were always disproportionately represented in the jail for as long as there were black people in Chicago. Um, this was a major point of open political discussion um, throughout the 1920s. It's why they moved Cook County Jail to the west side of Chicago because they didn't want the jail downtown. Um, but to me, it really takes off with the civil rights movement. The jail was being used for the political incarceration of African Americans. It's in the 1950s and 60s that uh, the jails in Chicago become majority black institutions, right? So over 50% of people in jail were African American. Um, so this is a point of policy discussion. It's not a question of what do we do with this jail? It's a question of what do we do with this jail that is predominantly black? Um, and so to me, the story of mass incarceration is intrinsic to the to jails, to what jails do. Um, but certainly it's part of, you know, the kind of backlash or front lash to the civil rights movement. These are as much tools of kind of targeting black liberation uh, and demands for the recognitions of kind of humanity and civil rights um, as they are for, you know, detaining people before trial. 
what changes, I think, in the 1980s, which is not unimportant, um, is the expansion of jails uh, in size. They hadn't had the capacity before and the technology that could be used to jails. So the rise of uh, electronic monitoring or shackling um, that could be used to jail someone in their own home. So uh, the history of race and jails is really uh, dynamic, but it's an open point of discussion I'm finding in political history. And do you think in today's jail culture, there is um, that correlation uh, still being made? Or do you think that the carceral state of America, as it has evolved today, um, is not necessarily race blind, but, but it's not as much of a racialized problem as it is an institutional problem, uh, the way that we you know, treat particular offenses uh, and you know, the way that the judicial or legal process works or doesn't work. Um, is, is the problem with mass incarceration today um, less of a racial problem? No. Um, and the reason I would say that is because using the jail as a tool of racialized political authority is the purpose of the institution. Uh, it is there to consolidate power over communities of color, uh, as well as people who are, are lower class of all races. Um, so I don't think you can de-link race in jails. And if anything, the challenge is more profound. In Cook County, uh, something like 80% of people in jail uh, are people of color today, right? And we have a sheriff who never mentions race. He would like us to not ever mention race, um, but it's at the very heart and purpose um, of the institutions. And, you know, one way I like to think about it is that there is no such thing as an anti-racist jail. It just doesn't exist. I mean, that, that is such a, such an indictment of our justice system. Um, to basically, you're saying there is absolutely no equal justice under the law in the prison population. Yeah, and incarcerated people have been saying this always um you know but is that the key to the prescription here uh because i do want to spend some time now talking about prescriptive measures one thing i didn't hear you say was that the corporatization or monetization of the prison industrial complex is to blame and i just wanted to ask you that to, to launch into our discussion about solutions or prescriptions um how much of that was not a factor when you first started chronicling jails um, versus today? That, that, that is the fact that it was in, in, in imprisoning people basically was being incentivized by, by a, a monetary gain. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Sometimes people will talk about this in terms of prison privatization. Right. Um, and I'm less interested in that because most jails are publicly operated. And so there are people who benefit from contracts with jails, you know, providing things like food or health care, depending on where you are. Um, but these are really public institutions. And so I think we have to look to, you know, an analysis of liberalism. Why do we think of jails as important sources of jobs? And why are these the only good jobs that we can offer in cities? And they aren't good jobs, right? People get traumatized, they get hurt at work. Um, these are miserable places to work. Uh, but I think it's, it's worth considering the many financial imperatives for these institutions that again, having control over these jobs gives sheriffs uh, an outsized form of power. We don't have prisons that are run directly by elected officials. So that clearly would be a transition to a more just outcome or representative outcome. So t take us through what might be the incremental steps towards reform of this institution that you say right now, whether it's in Chicago, around the, the country, um, is plagued by unfairness. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't think jails can be reformed. I think the rot is too deep. Um, so, you know, I would join many activists and incarcerated people in saying that we need to empty out the jails, that most people don't belong Let, there. Let's, let's just take a pause, though, when you say that, because, you know, people, and I wouldn't say it's a, it's a, a, a single political party, both political parties are afraid of the language you just identified. Um, when you say empty out the jails, I want, I want to understand more specifically what, what you mean. Do you mean uh, pre, basically pre-incarceration for folks who, you know, if they could afford it, would be out on bail, you know, that, that in those cases, the jail is such a destructive or disastrous institution um, that it, that it basically prejudices the 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 whole possibility of equal justice under the law because if if a if someone accused of a crime can't afford bail and is sitting in a jail that that there's perhaps the argument that they lose um, basically the functionality they 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 can't you know to make decisions about their defense. Uh, I understand if you're going in that direction. I think you're speaking more broadly, but um, but what about what do you mean when you say empty jails? I mean, I think I think the it, it's interesting that you frame the question in terms of the concerns of people who are passionate about jailing, right? Who believe that jailing should be used for uh, control and racial regulation and political repression. Um, there are enough people in this society advocating for jails, uh, and after studying this issue for 10 years, um, I refuse to use my precious life to advocate for the caging of human beings. Um, so yes, we should abolish cash bail. If we're uncomfortable with releasing everyone awaiting trial, let's release most people awaiting trial. Um, let's take seriously the expansive evidence that these are institutions that create crime uh, that create harm both for the people incarcerated there and for the people who work there um, and let's imagine doing literally anything else with our tax dollars schools mental health care health care uh, basic needs provisions housing um, because most of the people who are in jail have experienced some form of poverty or deprivation. So I think if we want to think about um, what kind of world we could build where we're not relying on jails as this kind of reflection of our failures, what would it mean to build a more life affirming version of American urban governance? And I think we could do it. Um, I, I refuse to let go of my hope for that um, because I think the jail is probably one of the most cynical American political institutions. So in terms of that question of reliance on jails, I hear you saying that you don't live in a free society when you rely on disproportionately punishing people. Right there, there is basically in in the long understanding of human civilization, uh, there is a, a, a construct, um, and it's not necessarily a, a social construct. It could be a moral construct about uh, crime and how you you know penalize offenders. Um, and I don't think you're suggesting applying this to. Uh, a prison population of convicted you know felons you're not saying again i just want to make that distinction between jail and prison when you're talking about prisons that that house folks who have been convicted of crimes um you believe that there is a justice system that that does have to punish uh people um for certain crimes are you specifically just referring to jails when you talk about this? You're referring to prison too. I'm against caging human beings. Um, I think we could think much more expansively about freedom um, and what it looks like to actually um, hold people accountable for crimes 
what it looks like to uh, recognize their humanity. And even if I think, you know, maybe they're at the end of the day, they're just people we don't want in our society. That's a sliver of the number of people in prison. Um, so I, I personally choose to use, you know, my knowledge and my, my political power um, as a citizen uh, to advocate for as little incarceration as possible, because I want to imagine a world without prisons and jails. Right. And I, and I think that most people would, would say that um, in terms of wanting to live somewhere, for example, where there isn't a large neighboring prison population. The whole point of that is, you know, you want to feel a sense of safety, security, um, that it, there is neighborliness in your community, that, that there are, you know, good people who are law-abiding and thoughtful, compassionate citizens. Um, so, I mean, on the left and the right, you probably have a consensus there when it, when it comes to, you know, wanting to have the, the, the least possible incarceration. Um, but where I guess it's a culture of divide right now in, in this country is what ought to constitute a long sentence or, or incarceration. Um, and there seems to be increasingly a bipartisan consensus that the decades-long war on drugs um, uh, was, you know, if not needless, extremely um, problematic um, and uh, basically created an incentive for mass incarceration. Um, wh where do you see that conversation culturally going in terms of kind of how you can potentially over time make incarceration uh, less and less of option A as opposed to, you know, option C or D? Well, I think like a lot of people who care about this country, right, I'm playing the long game um, in terms of how I think about it. What I have found with my research on the history of jails is that we don't even know what questions to ask. It, journalists, uh, community members, uh, folks of all stripes don't necessarily know what it would look like to have jails that were politically accountable to them or reflective of their values because they don't even know what's happening in their own jails. Right. right. So this kind of knowledge isn't everything, but this deficit, I think, presents a real challenge, you know, particularly as here in Connecticut, where I am, um, our state legislature has been aggressively you know, even as we're making weed something you can go buy at a nice boutique store, uh, aggressively criminalizing children uh, for stealing cars. That's not the war on drugs, but that's expanding criminalization and turning to the criminal justice system to uh, try and solve other problems. And so um, I retain my sense of hope so that I can survive. Uh, but at the same time, I am convinced that the bipartisan passion for jailing as a deployment of political power uh, and racial repression is an addiction in this country. And I really don't see people as trying to heal from that in any kind of good faith way. And I think that's why community-based initiatives uh, in terms of mutual aid, um, in terms of uh, trying to repair harm rather than calling the cops on a more kind of intimate level. I think those initiatives are really important uh, for where we look to people who are saying they have the solutions to these problems. And do you think, we just have seconds left, but do you think this a starting point is this bipartisan uh, movement now on um, drug offenders at least, uh, starting with the first step back, but other, uh, just sort of a consciousness about, you know, there shouldn't be um, years long sentences for nonviolent offenses. Like, the, do, you, do you have any 
um, hopefulness in, in, in that, uh, because you said there's a bipartisan addiction to incarceration, but there seems to be a bipartisan movement um, to decarcerate, at least when it comes to nonviolent offenders. Yeah, but I mean, who is categorized as violent, right? That's a fluid kind of categorization. Um, I think both parties are passionate about uh, the status quo. And when you have one political party that sanctions insurrection, um, I don't necessarily think bipartisan anything is uh, going to be a solution. Um, you do know, just, and I have to say this, just the, the, the folks who, you make a very valid point, but you know what folks say in response to the comment about the insurrection, which was the particular incidents of violent crime during the summer of protests of the Floyd murder. Do you just not take that at face value, you know, that that, that actually happened, or you think that it's just grossly overestimated? There was, you know, there was arson People. looting are much more excited to call property damage violence than they are storming the Capitol. Um, well, at least one political and, party is, yeah. <laughs> you know, so... Um, I hear you. I hear, we're, we're out of time. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that uh, your point about not, know, not caring about what goes on in a local jail is really important. And that the vast majority of the American electorate would say, that is an underworld that I'm not going to concern myself with. And I hope that changes. And I hope your book, um, methodically researching um, the evolution of jail in Chicago, Cook County, is, is going to help accomplish that. Melanie Newport, historian at UConn and author of the forthcoming This Is My Jail, Local Politics and the Rise of Mass Incarceration. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.